Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matthew Robinson. I'm the reInvent Australia Vice President. At reInvent Australia, we aim to deliver um, thought-provoking presentations, events and insights that focus on Australia's national competitiveness and quality of life. If you're not already a member of, of reInvent Australia or a subscriber, I'd encourage you to jump onto our website and sign up. This afternoon, we'll be delivering a presentation by Oliver Freeman and Richard Watson on what is the role that national borders will play post COVID-19. As you're probably aware, Oliver and Richard have been in the vanguard of futurists engaging with organisations to think strategically about the world yet to come. They'll present this afternoon their preliminary scenar scenarios for a post COVID world, and then we hope to engage in a 15 minute Q&A session. To submit your questions, you will need to use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the Zoom webinar window. We aim to cover a fair bit during today's seminar, particularly how, will, how might globalisation play post COVID-19? How will countries like Australia and the UK manage the, their borders while handling economic pressures? Where does Brexit fit in with our alternative futures? And what will COVID-19 mean for Australia's relations with China and the rest of the world? We've already factored in a, a, a series of questions that some of the attendees of today's events have already submitted into us. So we'll, we'll be looking to have a fairly uh, robust discussion. However, before we kick off, I thought I might provide a brief introduction for those of you who are not acquainted with Oliver and Richard. Um, Oliver Freeman is a futurist working in Sydney, one of Australia's foremost exp exponents of, of scenario planning. He's a co-founder of reInvent Australia and its first vice president. Richard Watson is resident in the United Kingdom and is a prominent futurist who has written several books about the future. He's co-written Future Vision with Oliver, and they've worked with clients such as Sir George Bank, Teaching Australia, the State Library of New South Wales, and the Atlantic Lotteries Corporation in Canada. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over today to Richard to start off the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what, I, what I'd like to do is start off just thinking very briefly about what it's like to think about the future in 2020. Um, I think before this pandemic hit, things were getting more difficult. And I think that was because there were more actors on the stage. And also, in particular, there was, there was an acceleration going on. And this, interestingly, was... Uh, theme picked up by um, Alvin and Heidi Toffler in the early 70s with their book Future Shock. And, and the premise of that book was that the perception of too much change over too short a period of time would create a kind of instability, particularly a mental instability. And I think that that sort of defines our era to some extent. Um, technology in particular is accelerating with increasing velocity, but our, our sort of cave person brains are not. They're essentially the same. And that's, that's creating some sort of friction, some tension. Um, the other thing that, that has made it very difficult to think about the future at the moment is, is volatility. Now, you, you, most people are probably aware of VUCA, but if not, VUCA was a term developed by or created by the US Department of Defense um, around about 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down. And it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And I, I think that perfectly describes the world in, in 2020. So the, there, are, there are more elements they move faster, they collide with each other with greater velocity, and it's just becoming extremely difficult. Now, having said that, some things have always been reasonably foreseeable. I mean, I would cite demographics as, as the key one there. I mean, short of a pandemic with much greater mortality than around 1%, you know, or World War Three, or China suddenly deciding to have three, three kids per couple, demographics is extremely foreseeable. I mean, we know how many people are likely to be in the world in 20, 30 years time. We know the age composition of nations. I mean, what we don't know is income. We don't know how they consume, how they behave, what their attitudes will be. But physical numbers of people is fairly foreseeable. Um, geology is pretty foreseeable. Um, geography up to a point is fairly foreseeable. Some people, and I would sort of cite myself here, would argue that psychology is, is reasonably unchanging and foreseeable. And you can also see broad patterns over, over decades. I mean, what China is doing the, relative to the US climate, AI are relatively foreseeable, but you, we're not seeing anything specific, nothing granular. We are seeing outlines of the future. We're seeing shadows, if you like. Now, I think the further out you go into the future, the vaguer all of this gets. Um, you know, you, you cannot be specific, you cannot be granular. Um, and the only thing you can really say about the world or Australia in 10 or 20 or 50 years time is that it's uncertain. Some people might say it will be different, but it, it, it fundamentally will be uncertainty. But within that sort of thought, the uncertainty thought lies potentially a solution. 
in that if the world is fundamentally uncertain going forward, logically there must be more than one possibility. There must be multiple futures. And that essentially forms the foundation of scenario planning. And I, to my mind, I mean, Oliver's going to explain this in a minute, but to my mind, the worst thing you can do about the future is just not think about it at all. The next worst thing is to just extend present conditions forward in a rather sort of simplistic linear manner and then the third thing you could do which isn't great is just take one guess and i think the basis of scenario planning is you're taking multiple guesses hopefully on a inf vaguely informed basis and that gives you the scenarios and the scenarios are ways they're not they're not ways of predicting the future as such they are ways of hedging it and ways of wind tunneling your thoughts about what is going to happen or you know what you're planning to do in terms of strategy or capital expenditure or risk exposure or, or or anything like that so it is a deeply complicated and flawed process thinking about the future but i again I come back to the thought that it's better than not thinking about it at all um the pandemic by the way which i, I guess is the sort of elephant in the room to some extent here i mean this was foreseen there's no question that it was not foreseen um it was top of the UK government's risk register for a very long time. I was in some cabinet office workshops where that was validated. But again, we, we, we saw it in terms of it's going to come at some point. We saw it in outline, but everyone was still rather caught out because of the specifics. We didn't know when it was going to hit. We didn't know the precise nature that it would unfold. Um, and there were also sort of financial elements. I mean, we were sort of prepared for it mentally, but not financially, which is another argument altogether. Um, anyway, I think Oliver is now going to sort of um, take over a little bit and talk about the scenario planning process generally and also specific to the inquiry we are talking about today. So thank you and Oliver. Thank you very much, uh, George. If we could have the next slide, that would be great. Um, uh, uh, start. Okay, so you've got me there. Sorry, the video wasn't working for some reason. Uh, that was an excellent sort of introduction. And one of the things I like to suggest is the great value of scenario planning as a process is that it actually welcomes uncertainty. It's built on uncertainty. And there is no way if you get into a scenario planning process that you can avoid confronting the uncertainties, which we are, of course, very well aware of every day of our lives. We've developed uh, over, I mean, Richard and I have been working together for about 15, 20 years. Uh, and I've been sort of immersed in scenario work since I got hooked up with a group in the US called GBN in the early 90s. Uh, and we've developed uh, over the last 15 years, a five step scenario planning process. Now, I don't want to uh, blind you with the, some attempt at science, uh in the short time we had but i do you know it, being a scenario planner is being like a good waiter in the strategy uh restaurant and what we want to do is to have a process which you don't see but which actually helps you to structure and think about the future and we have this five-step process that we've developed the first step is questions. You can't, you can't create scenario futures in a vacuum. You have to have a purpose. So the purpose is critical. We've introduced a new second step in the, pro, in the original shell process, uh, which is we call utopia. And this is simply to say what we all feel is we want to know in your organization, in your country, whatever it is you're doing, what exactly are the most important things that you would see um, unfolding in the future to the benefit of your, of your group? So it is the preferred future or utopia step. Step three is to say, well, all of this is happening in an environment. And we don't mean by that a natural environment only, but the built environment, every environment you can think of. And we need to identify what is happening externally to us as an organization, what is going on that's relevant to our organization and the framing question. Out of all of that, we build scenarios and the scenarios are built, they're not attempts at predicting the future. What they are attempting is to cover a wide enough range of future possibilities that we feel to some extent comfortable that we, whatever it might then emerge, we can focus on and understand how it might fit in uh, to our strategic framework. And last but not 
least in the in the process is the whole issue relating to strategy so we we've we've got, we've got a question that we've been interrogating the future about we know where we would like our business or whatever the organization is to go we understand how the external environments uh, might play out we built scenarios from the, those play things that we've looked at and last but not least we want to know well what do we do about it um, and that is you know in a nutshell is what we the scenario planning process is about um george if we could move on to my next slide and on this slide we just simply have a framing question uh and as i said in my earlier bit you need you you have to have a purpose you can't make scenarios in a vacuum. You have to have a, a, a strong sense of why you want to interrogate the future. Now, Richard and I, when we were uh, thinking about the process that we've started on post COVID-19, the first thing we asked ourselves is, well, what would be a question which would involve pretty well everybody on the planet? Uh, you know, if we asked a question simply about um, the future of hairdressing, uh, that's not going to involve many people. There will be some people who are passionate about the future of hairdressing, but there'll be a lot of others who couldn't care less. But the role of national borders, this is the framing question that we came up with, the role of national borders in the world after the COVID-19 pandemic has ended, did seem to us like a really interesting question that would involve everybody from governments to corporations to uh, civilians to uh, communities uh, to countries etc 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 so we decided to put our, our faith in that as a way of kicking off an interesting debate about the world after COVID-19 so I'll stop there and throw the environment piece over to Richard um, Georgia can we get the next slide Thank you. Okay, so so what we did, as we always do, is we we first of all we just Oliver and myself in this instance to begin with, sat down and thought about the drivers of change, if you like, or what, what we sometimes refer to as the critical uncertainties. So what are the things that are incredibly important in terms of creating the future, but retain a high level of uncertainty? And um, we we came up with the list that you can see here. Um, the first one, by the way, I think is is a really big one and it's been talked about quite a lot now and it sort of forms the basis of every government's response to the pandemic. This sort of tension between keeping the economy alive and everybody else and, and that's still going on right now. This is going on in Europe right now with, with, within tourism is, you know, we need the Brits money in Spain, but we don't really want the Brits. Um, so this sort of gr health versus wealth dynamic we felt was, was pretty important. Um, the second one, which is to do with um, natural systems change. I mean, we don't, we're not just talking about climate change here, which would be the sort of the knee jerk um, reaction. We're talking about all natural systems. So we're talking about climate change, biodiversity, um, water, topsoil, erosion, you know, the whole, the whole lot. Um, the third one around surveillance states is obviously very pandemic. I mean, we saw a lot of the sort of the technology being developed very quickly around track and trace, particularly in Asia. And there was a big discussion about whether or not um, th this was going to be applied, applied to other areas. Um, the, the sort of anxiety du jour before the pandemic hit was, was clearly around the fact that robots were going to eat our jobs and, and, and AI more specifically. Um, and we were looking at job substitution all the rest of it. And actually, it's actually quite interesting to me at the moment that everyone's sort of working from home which and staring at a screen, which strikes me as something that is very replicable by, by a computer or some other form of machine. So that, that would be an interesting one. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through every single one of these particularly, but um, actually just, I just can't read that on the screen. So I'm just going to bring something up. Um, hang on a second. Um, Actually, I'm, I will quickly go through all of them. I just, I can't see them on the screen. So I'm, I'm getting them up on another document. Um, this sort of balance between the physical and the virtual has come through very strongly. I mean, obviously a lot of sort of life has moved to the virtual, we're virtual now, be this relationships, be it, be it retail, um, what have you. Um, views towards the environment um, were, were obviously a big thing here. And I think one of the things to be said about the pandemic, although we're supposed to be talking 
post pandemic but one of the things that struck me as quite interesting about the pandemic which it was accelerating and deepening things that were happening already so i would argue for example that globalization was also was falling apart before the pandemic hit um you know we were moving more and more to to online relationships before the pandemic hit i, I think arguably the world was going into recession as well before the pandemic hit and it's it simply um accelerated that um, there were some interesting generational differences in terms of attitudes and behavior, particularly um, with relation to the environment. So um, Extinction Rebellion was really interesting in that, in that particular area. I mean, Black Lives Matter, which I should point out, this happened after we had created most of this. So th that's something we may come back to at some point. Um, the poli trust in politicians is a critical one, and it's interesting how varied that, that has been. Um, Nobody trusts politicians in the UK anymore, I think, because they break their own rules. They're very inconsistent. I can't speak for Australia. I haven't been watching it closely enough. Um, Germany, everyone loves the government. They've done a really good job. Greece, where I've just been, um, everyone absolutely adores the government because they've done a, a cracking job. And even within the UK, and we might, I think we'll come to this with the questions, the sort of regional governments have done a rather good job. So Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland seem to have responded better than, than central government in London. And that may have knock-on effects in terms of devolution or, or something. Um, one of the drivers Oliver and I particularly like is, a, is this sort of we, me, social orientation. You know, is it individualism or is it the group? And again, you can see this playing out with the pandemic. So the US and arguably the UK up to a point is about empowered individualism. You know, I will, I will decide what's good for me. Whereas in places like Singapore or South, South Korea, um, it, is, it is considered that, well, the government knows what's best for me and we will all work as a whole. And that there's a real sort of conflict going on there. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go through every, every single one, but things like longevity and, and so on um, were factors as well. Now, what we did is Oliver and I had uh, quite a long series of discussions about what the list of these things is going to be. We then threw the list out to a small group of people and asked them what they thought. And we specifically asked them to rank these drivers um you know what are the major ones what are the minor ones and we also asked them if anything was missing from the list and a few things you know came back our way i mean things like cyber crime um was one of the factors that i remember somebody said is, is missing off the list but from this list we narrowed it down and we started creating um some matrices which i think oliver is now going to pick up on where that went so thank you oliver right i'm back uh yeah thank you richard um, what we like to do is to take this uh, bundle of influences um, and to identify one or two or three or four, the, the ones that will come at the top of the list, um, on the basis of two measures. The first is how important they are. What is the impact of this particular influence on the framing question? Uh, and the second question is how volatile is this influence in terms of its uh, uncertainty as to the way it might play out in the future. And we came up, uh, and Georgia will now put on the slide, uh, with a matrix based on two of the uh, 12 influences that you saw. Uh, in the vertical axis, we were looking at the manage, what we call the management of natural systems. We didn't want to focus just on the fact that natural systems will be hard to handle, and we're talking here about climate change, among other things, but we wanted also to sort of bring into the story the human bit, the Anthropocene sort of component. So, well, okay, we've got this volatile world we're in now, uh, with uh, pandemics and fires and floods and all sorts of things going on. So the question is, what is the style of management that we are bringing to bear on those problems? And the, what the axis does is to present a spectrum from the chaotic management of natural systems at the top to a control of management systems at the bottom. Now, that particular uh, dimension uh, is, of course, uh, of, of interest for itself. You could start thinking about scenarios just around that, that particular spectrum. Um, but we want more richness in the, in what we, the way we're thinking. 
And we came across with this second item, which was around economic priorities. Uh, and we wanted to put against the management of natural systems, the whole idea of uh, whether our economic priorities were aimed at making a profit. So the traditional capitalist virtues, or where we actually wanted to our uh, economic and related activity to be based on ethics and principles. And we threw up four uh, scenarios by put, pitching these two uh, variables against each other. Um, those of you who know our book on uh, future vision that Richard and I wrote will not, well, may remember that the scenarios there were based on Beatles songs and because we, we like a, a nice idea when, when we get hold of it, uh, we decided that we would give our scenarios uh, a Beatles flavour. So they are together known as the Tomorrow Never Knows scenarios. Which well, actually, can I come in there? Yeah. I, we are, I think, at some point going to have to change these names because they are showing our age somewhat. Well, they're certainly showing yours, Oliver. I'm 26. I've just partied a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but they, yeah, I mean, we, I think that, I think they are tr uh, wonderful. But we may possibly have to come up with something else. But they they work a treat at the moment. Yeah, they're good. They're and, good for anyone over forty. And the thing I love about the tomorrow never knows bit is that actually, if I can't think of anything that is more significant pointer to the challenge of scenario planning, that tomorrow doesn't know because it's not here. We only know what's here now. Uh, and uh, so that sort of encompasses for me the challenge of scenario planning. We then came up with these four worlds um, from the bottom left sort of swinging around the long and winding road, money that's what I want, revolution, um, has an R in brackets because it's not necessary, There's a, that's a very sort of, uh, uh, what's the word, it's an unstable, very volatile future. Uh, and here comes the sun which is probably looking towards Scandinavia, or might have been uh, in a past, a past time. So those are the four scenarios. We, um, I haven't mentioned this yet to Graham. We do have some words relating to the scenarios, which I'm sure we'd be very happy to let you have. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll work out a way of doing that later on. So I think that's all I want to say about the, uh, the, the scenarios that we've created. And we now really need to look at the questions that uh, uh, are being asked. Fantastic. Thank you, Oliver and Richard, for the, for the wonderful introduction. Look, we might move into part of the Q&A session, and I'd encourage uh, the attendees to submit their questions via the Q&A. But as I indicated at the outset of the presentation, we've already had some attendees uh, raise some questions in advance. So I think the first question perhaps if I can pose to Richard, there's been lots of discussions about uh, alterations to supply chains um, arising from COVID, um, particularly uh, uh, countries looking at, at their, their security of supply of medical equipment. Um, one of the questions is, is, is will global, do you think globalisation is going to be reversed post COVID-19? No, so is globalisation really a package or is it, or is it a disparate bundle of, of, bundle of things? Interesting your thoughts. I mean, I, this is, I mean, this is almost the key question, isn't it? Um, and, um, you know, the whole point of scenarios is back to the thought that, you know, I just don't know. But, you know, when, once we've developed some scenarios, we've, we've got sort of multiple ways of, of, of looking at that, different lenses to look at the question through. Um, as I said earlier, I think it was already beginning to fray around the edges quite significantly. Um, I think, in, you know, in the early days, I remember globalization was, was essentially Americanization and the export of American products, goods and values around, around the world. And that sort of hit into particularly China after a little while. And it was interesting during the pandemic that looking at the EU, um, which is supposed to be this sort of cohesive group, um, when it hit, they all basically flocked back to their borders and started developing national policies to deal with it. There was, there was very little cooperation going on there and there's now there's now all sorts of argument between the north and the south about you know the, the the funding to actually sort the economic aftermath out so i think i think globalization is definitely in trouble there's there's no question about that and I, one of the things we pick up in on in the scenarios is 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 a, a sort of level of nuance so for example 
I think it's quite likely, personally, that, that digital globalization and virtual globalization will continue with, with some exceptions. I mean, places like China and some other places may, may block certain things. But generally speaking, there will be a relatively frictionless flow of digital information and, and virtual worlds around the globe. But I think that the physical movement of people in particular, um, of good services, possibly capital, is going to be significantly restrained um, and there are various scenarios there so you know in, in some instances it will be heavily restrained in other instances it will be minimally uh, restrained so I, again I think this this comes back to how uh, the usefulness of scenarios so there's, there's lots of different ways of looking at that again it's at the moment it's very very difficult to tell I mean it's it's you know it ain't over yet it's very early days these are supposed to be the sort of the post pandemic scenarios and we're I'm not sure we're in the middle of it anymore, but the, the big question is whether we get a significant second wave or not, which would change the landscape very significantly, in my view. But Richard, can I just add a couple of points on, on globalization? Firstly, um, this is a favorite point of mine, which is that globalization does not exist. There is no such thing as globalization. It's a massive abstraction that we have made over the last 50 years to describe uh, some as um, and very critical important aspects of human behavior. So responding to the question from my point of view is quite tricky if you start off with that premise in your mind. Having said that, I do understand the abstraction has, has merit. And if you look at the scenarios and if you go around the scenarios in a clockwise direction, then globalization changes quite significantly as we move from one scenario to the other. And when we come around to the, the, to the here comes the sun scenario, which is number four, going clockwise, starting at the bottom left, uh, we're in a situation where the emphasis on localization and the local is so important that although we have a global world in many aspects, it's no longer the driver uh, that, it, that it is, certainly, say, in the long and winding road scenario. So I'm just, yeah. I mean, the thing I'd add to that, Oliver, is I, th I think 10 years ago, maybe, maybe 20, certainly before 2008, the GFC, I think we were probably in one, the long and winding road. I think until the, very recently, until the pandemic hit, my, to my mind, we were very much in, in uh, the money scenario, the sort of top left, not what we call scenario two. Um, and now again, we're, you know, are we going into a period of revolution? We're not sure. And again, it, I, I think it's quite a, an interesting um, matrix this one i do quite like the sub profit principle thing and the chaos control and, and don't chaos control by the way to my mind i think all of you may slightly disagree with this it's not i like thinking of chaos control not just about natural systems i think that could also be read as the human reaction to natural systems all right well following on for the issue of, of chaos um a question's been raised in terms of the potential collapse of monetary systems. Um, there's been substantial, still huge bailouts by governments around the country, and concerns that that uh, reserve banks, printing machines are going in, going gangbusters to try to support the um, the economic stimulus packages. Um, question's been raised by the audience: How will countries like Australia and the UK? manage their borders whilst also handling the economic pressures. Maybe I can sort of hand this over to Oliver to, if we can kick off that, that, the answer to that question. This is a complex uh, question, Matt, and uh, I've had a bit of a think about it. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it runs a little bit parallel to the conversation we've just had about globalization. So if you're in that bottom left quadrant uh, with the long and winding road, um, it does seem to me that the borders that we are, are running are ambiguous um, because we're in a world where there is fantastic movement and relatively free movement of digital stuff, but uh, uh, a, a relative level of restriction on physical, the physical movement of goods and people. So it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one to, to follow. Um, in terms of the four scenarios, probably, uh, as I said, the, here comes the sun scenario because of its emphasis on the local, then although border, border control is significant, it's not as important a feature uh, in our daily lives as it is today. The, probably of the four scenarios, the revolution one is the one where um, the world looks uh, 
like it's under control, but where society is on the edge. You know, so you get the sense in uh, the revolution scenario that things feel as if they're all right, but maybe it's all about to go wrong. Um, I, in, in terms of sort of specifics of border control, I don't think there is going to be any um, smooth kind of process taking us forward. Firstly, and this picks up on some of the other questions that have been asked, it is quite clear to me that any thought that uh, the pandemic will end, you know, by the end of February next year is way off, off being. I think we are stuck. I think the pandemic is with us at least until 2025 in some form or another. I don't see it as a short term, quick get out. And I think that the point about that that I've just made is that the effects of the pandemic are going to be felt in all sorts of ways that we, we do understand now uh, for a long time to come. So when we talk about scenarios in a post-COVID world, in my head, we're not, we're not really thinking about the world uh, much before 2025 and beyond. So that's probably, uh, Matt, all, all I'll say on this question, which is a, a bit tricky. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'm a bit shocked in terms of COVID uh, and spanning out to 2025. Um, a question for be put for Richard. Um, uh, Brexit occurred bright, sunny days in the United Kingdom um, in the absence of any notions of pandemic. Um, how is the UK's decision now to implement the separation from the EU uh, going to complicate matters um, uh, in the midst of this pandemic? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. I, I think at the moment, the, the, the scenarios haven't factored in Brexit. I mean, where, where we're at at the moment is we're developing a table of key characteristics. So, you know, what are the key features of each of these four worlds? And from that table, we're developing some short narratives, short stories, if, if you like, which ex explain what it's like to live in each of these, if, each of these future worlds. And we possibly we'll put Brexit into there. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I, I remember having a discussion with somebody pre-pandemic about Brexit, which was just completely dominant. And I'm not sure you, you know this, but pre-pandemic, Britain was split in two. And it was a bit like the US um, and the, the red and the blue states. I mean, people, they, they didn't just disagree with each other. They, they were on the border of hating each other. And I remember having a, a discussion with somebody saying, I don't know how this is ever going to get resolved. How do you bring both of those two sides together, short of having an existential threat? And that's clearly what we've got. And nobody really talks about Brexit at the moment. I don't think outside of Westminster and, and you know, Edinburgh and places, nobody, nobody really cares very much. Um, what I do think is happening at the moment, and this, I think this may continue going forward, pandemic or not, is there's been an outbreak of anxiety and it borders on fear at times. And when that happens historically, we tend to revert to tribal behavior. And I think we're seeing that right now. So the pandemic specifically, but volatility in general would tend to favor, in my view, deglobalization. There is, an interesting debate about whether sustainability would favor deglobalization. My, my gut feel is that it would. Um, it, it feels like localization is, is friendlier um, to the problems we face than, than globalization. Um, you know, and, and, and just making things more locally and consuming more locally in theory would, would be a good thing, but it would be sort of anti-globalization, but I'm, I'm not really sure about that at the moment. Um, as I said earlier on, I think the, the, the Scottish government in particular, but also the Welsh and Northern Irish um, assemblies, their reaction to the pandemic seems to have been better or stronger than the Westminster response. And how that plays out will be quite interesting. I mean, the, the, the Scottish government in particular has always had the agenda of an, another vote or separation from the EU, from the um, UK, sorry, from Brit England. There's so many countries in the UK. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think it's almost inevitable that's, that that's going to happen. And I'm, you know, I'm surprised in the sense that we're holding it together from Westminster because it could actually benefit England for, for um, Scotland to sort of float off on their own. The other, by the way, the other division that, that is interesting is it's not just Scotland, England or anything. There is a, quite a division between the North and the South. And I don't think this is quite so true in Australia because, you know, you've got Melbourne and Sydney are, are similar in size. You've then got the government in Canberra 
you know, you've, you've got multiple major cities. Now, in the UK, we haven't really got another London. And the same would be true in Germany. It's, it's quite regionalized. And the government is obviously trying to do that. But I'm not sure that's, that's really going to work. And I think that that's true across a lot of places, that there is... Um, a population density in one place, that's where the elite tend to be, that's where the media is, that's where the decisions are made, but that's not necessarily benefiting everybody else. And, you, and historically, there's a lot of tension as well. So you, you think of things like um, Catalonia or, or the Basque region or something, they are reasonably keen to separate. So I, my gut feel is that there will, if you like, be more countries in the future, not less, if you like. Um, and I think the pandemic will definitely complicate matters um, going forward. But again, there are, there are events that we have not foreseen that could come out of nowhere that could move this in all kinds of directions at the moment or going forward. Can I just jump in there, uh, Richard? You talked about mm -hmm. the, the propensity for, for there being uh, greater separations, more countries uh, and localizations. I, I was uh, taken back by the, 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 the quite diverse ways in which the health approach has been managed in Europe um, in terms of the fatalities in, in Italy, Spain and, and the UK compared to other countries, for example, in Greece. Do you think there's any risk that the EU will separate? I'm on record as saying it's inevitable and I'll, I'll stick to that. I mean, there is an old futurist trick where you're never wrong as a futurist. The, the response is simply give it time, you know? Um, and if you're willing to wait a hundred years, most things will come to pass, whatever you think, as far as I can tell. I'm being a little bit flippant here, but there, there's something in that to some extent. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think it's, abs I remember writing a book in uh, Future Files, which I wrote in 2006, came out in 2007. And even that far back, I thought it was going to splinter. Um, and it, it, the reason is essentially tribal. You're trying to sort of, take several hundred years of European history and sort of sh shove them together. And it works. Um, in fact, I remember, I remember talking to, uh, this sounds very pretentious, but it's not supposed to be. I was at the Sydney Writers' Festival, um, I can't remember how long ago, and I was, I was sat on a panel next to Vanis Farah, I can never, you know, I mean, the Greek finance minister or the ex one. And we had this sort of discussion about whether Europe was going to hold together or not. And his view was, well, it absolutely has to, because otherwise you will unleash, unleash these forces. And I think he meant forces of fascism. Um, and my view was, well, I just don't see how you can have Greece and Germany coexisting in the same economic agreement and, and socially as well. If you're trying to create a sort of unified social thing, how, how do you do that? And his, his response to that was, well, you know, in Britain, you've got Cornwall and you've got London and, you know, Cornwall, to be fair, isn't, isn't the strongest economy in the world, particularly not now with tourism. Um, how do you how do you put those two things together? And my response to that was, well, yeah, but we're in the same country, whereas, you know, Germany and Greece, that's just not the case. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's relatively inevitable because I just think there's too much difference there. And if if Europe went back to what it was in the first place, which was just a handful of nations, it was an economic agreement, trading agreement, and they were relatively similar. I mean, North Western European nations are relatively similar in many ways. But the minute you start going into Southern Europe and particularly the East, the Far East is where it, I think it really comes apart. You are creating more division. And the best way to make the EU stable, in my view, would be to shrink it. Um, but the, the natural inclination of, of EU politicians is to expand it. Like any organization, they want to be bigger. And I think therein lies its downfall. I'd like just to add a point there, Matt which is that uh, I think Brexit was ahead of its time. I think Brexit anticipated the consequence of pan the pandemic. And I think Boris got COVID-19 just to prove the point. I mean, I think it takes one more country to go or leave the EU, and I think it's all over. And the, the other problem, the EU, I'm not an economist, but it strikes me that they've got a real fatal flaw, which is the euro. You know, they have no, they have one, currency. They can't play games with currencies across, across the region, across the, the nations, whereas other countries can. And that, that's a bit of an Achilles heel to my mind. Right. Well, if we can back out of Europe for the moment, and I want to toss a, a question to Oliver if I can, um, move towards US-Asia relationships. Um, what, what, Oliver, what do you think that COVID-19 is going to mean for the US and China relationships? We've already seen a lot of rhetoric coming out of both sides, both countries. Um, are these tensions simply just the product of, of local consumer audiences applying up to their, their relevant bases? Or is this uh, going to be an ongoing post COVID-19 issue? What's your thoughts in relation to that? 
I, uh, it's, a, it's, it's such an interesting question and it, it's one of those questions which uh, for me exposes my, probably my lack of uh, deep understanding um, of certain aspects of uh, uh, the way the world operates and particularly between these two, the two major countries in terms of economies in the world, uh, China and the US. So I'm not sure where this is heading, but I do have, I do have some, I, I hope, quite interesting views. Firstly, I think that the tension between the US and China has nothing to do with the pandemic, it was not created by the pandemic, and I don't think the pandemic will have any impact on it in the future. I mean, both countries have a management problem with regard to the way they deal with the pandemic. But where I want to touch base is with, um, I used to work with GBN with a guy called Jay Ogilvy, and he posted a blog just the other day, which was really, really interesting. Um, and he suggested that there was a cultural difference between the US and, and China, which was somehow at the base of everything. And the, 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 the element that he focused on was this, that the US is essentially a rebellious country in the sense that it was made up by people in rebelling, but rebelling as individuals, not rebelling as a, a tribe. Uh, and that, that rebelliousness has, is, is expressing itself um, in, in later sort of life of the, the United States, is, is expressing itself in the point that Richard just raised, the me, I, you know, the, the, the individualistic meist kind of approach to the world. When you switch to China, you're in a completely different place. Here is a place where this, the most important activity that people undertake on a day-to-day -day basis is being obedient. They are told what to do. And, uh, you know, you have your door welded if you dare set your foot out of it uh, during a COVID bre uh, breakout. So you've got all these sort of strange sort of events, but the, the point is this, that this is a cultural issue between two really significant entities and that that cultural clash, as it were, uh, um, is under, lies underneath. It's nothing to do with Trump. I mean, Trump is just, uh, as in many things, he's just the, the, the symptom of something else. Uh, and that this deep underlying collision, if you like, between the social psychology of the Chinese and that, and that of uh, the US is a really significant issue uh, that's playing out during the COVID virus, but not created by it. So that's my, that's my sort of immediate spin on the question. But I'm also uh, ducking it to some extent because I'm probably not as well informed about uh, Sino-US matters as I should be. But I but think- can I come in? Yeah, you go, Richard. I mean, it, 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 I mean, at the moment, China is, is on everybody's mind. You know, it's where the pandemic originated. How they've dealt with it has been very different from other parts of the world. Um, and it, but this whole thing reminds me of a, a, some scenarios Oliver and I did in Sydney for St. George Bank back in, oh my God, 2005, looking at 2012. And if you remember, Oliver, we, we developed some scenarios and they were, they were all referencing Macquarie Fields, which are these sort of riots or unrest that had just happened. And China reminds me of that a little bit in that it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to get away from now mentally and particularly China now mentally and go 10 or 20 years into the future. It's a bit like the, the present has got this sort of gravitational pull and every time you sort of try and go out, you get sucked back in. Um, and it's extremely difficult to think about China without thinking about what it's doing right now. I mean, the key question to me with China is, you know, what does China want? Um, and I think what China wants is, is to be sort of back where they were for, what, 45 of the last 50 centuries. They would, they would like to be at the top table again and be a, be a significant economic, cultural player, if not the significant one. Although I think there's probably more, there's more to it than that. Um, that, that really is, is the question of what do they want? Um, and then how will the, the world react to whatever, whatever it is they want, which is possibly another set of scenarios altogether. Mm. We, did, we did do some work about 25 years ago on scenarios for the future of China with, with GBN, which was pretty interesting uh, and picked up very much on the point that you, you've just made. Um, the one thing that I would add uh, in, in terms of, you know, looking at the cultural issue is I, um, it, it's this, 
when you come when you come up with cultural issues you are in the world of the way people think you know it's in the what i call the world of world views it, it impacts on the way people see the world so we can throw scientific fact at people about climate change or whatever it might be but they have a world view which means this is the kind of policy that they're going to support um, and going back again to my gbn days I remember uh, Charles Hampton Turner coming up with a beautiful comparison, looking at capitalism in the US versus capitalism in China, uh, sorry, in, in Japan. And he said, the difference between these two is this, that if I'm Japanese, if I do what is good for the country, it's good for me. And if I'm in the United States, if I do what is good for me, it's good for the country. And that goes to some extent explaining the significance of the American dream uh, and everything that goes with that. So I'm just raising a point here generally that in the minefield of scenario development and scenario thinking is the world views of the participants are incredibly important and very difficult to get hold of. I've just had a comment from the audience, I think, which resonates with that, is that the US and China differences are values and beliefs based. Um, and if I can also just perhaps pose a question to Richard from one of the audience members, and I can think it probably resonates based upon the, the US-China um, disputation or, or, or um, disconnection. Um, we've seen India ban TikTok from, uh, uh, from its uh, social media as being a social media platform allowed. And so there's a question being raised in terms of the fragment, potential fragmentation of digital systems between uh, you know between two or three superpowers um, creating their own uh, digital platforms um, in which their societies operate. Um, what what's your thought in terms of that scenario as to um, the development of of you know relationships between countries and also the the smooth flow of of information? Um, I mean, two two answers to that. Um, at the moment. Well, no, I'll start with my second thought. Um, there's a very good book I read, which is probably behind me somewhere, called The Future of the Internet by Jonathan Zittran, who's at Oxford. And it's quite an old book now. It must be at least 15 years old. But he thought that the most likely scenario for the future of the internet was a sort of balkanization. It was going to splinter, the splinternet, as he was referring to it. Um, and I, I would tend to agree with that. Um, it, it is not in most large governments' interest to let information flow freely. And one of the things that may come out of the pandemic is, is a sort of move towards bigger government, more surveillance and, 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 um, and control. Um, I think that's distinctly possible. Um, the other thing with China, and again, this sort of falls into the trap of, of just focusing on what is happening right now and not escaping from right now. There does seem to be a lot of almost briefing against China going on, just reading the papers and watching the television at the moment, there is this sort of anti-China thin thing building. And I do worry, I mean, I'm worried about China, but I'm also worried that possibly they're going to be, there's going to be some sort of scapegoating going on. And if Trump is really struggling to be re-elected, one of the, the sort of old tricks to do would be essentially just to start a war somewhere to galvanize the people. And I just hope that doesn't happen. But, um, but back to the, the exam question in particular, I, I think it is inevitable that it's going to splinter. Um, in the short term, we will see uh, more things not allowed. I mean, we're on Zoom right now. Are we on Zoom? I think we're on Zoom. I mean, that's, you know, it has some Chinese connections. Um, and, you know, we will, we will grow our own tech increasingly, I think, to some extent. Although it's not going to be necessarily countries. It, it could be it could be regions. Um, so you, you, know, you could have globalization to some extent falling apart, but still have regional blocks that operate quite cohesively. I mean, arguing against myself, it could, you know, the EU could be a block. Um, there could be a sort of pan-Pacific block and so on and so forth. All right, we've got a further questions coming in from the audience. Um, uh, one of the questions is talking about the ability to plan scenarios out to 2025. Um, the comments ra raising that that typically scenarios are, are, are set out a long way uh, to discourage simple trend extensions. But with the substantial amount of un uncertainty um, with COVID-19, uh, obviously a shorter time frame is going to be adopted in terms of scenario planning. So what are the sorts of things that you think we can, we can plan and set out to, for 2025 and 2030? That sounds like a question for Oliver, but I'll come in later. Yeah, I, well, the, the point is there isn't, that there isn't a generic answer to that question in the sense there's a date that, that you, going back to the work that we did 
with Sir George Bank on the future of financial services in Australia, essentially. We have a uh, seven year time frame. I think it was 2012 was the, yep. was the scenario year. We were doing the work in 2005. Now that's an incredibly short period of time, but then the finance industry is very volatile and is subject to significant shifts um, on a daily basis. We did work with Lendlease on the, one of their property divisions on the future of uh, urban development. And we went out 60 years because they were already working on projects out for 20 years. So uh, my first answer to the question is it depends on, if you like, what I call the client or, or the, the person who, for whom the scenarios are being developed. Um, secondly, it, there's always going to be a problem, and Richard's raised this point twice, it's the Macquarie Fields point uh, problem, which is that you, you, res you respond to the here and now and think somehow you're going to be in a position to use that, uh, those ideas and that development to do your strategic planning over the short term. The reality is we know, uh, take, take Sydney and Melbourne in terms of COVID-19. You know, two months ago, uh, as Wally Daly uh, put, put in a wonderful little article, he said, we were all in the same boat. We were all doing things uh, that were going to promote and help the future of Australians, whether we lived in Victoria or New South Wales or in one of the other states. And then suddenly it all changes. We, uh, we, we were saying goodbye to the wave in New South Wales and Victoria is waving the new wave. And suddenly the Victorians are having to do stuff that we are not doing. So we're no longer doing it for ourselves. Uh, we're doing it, sorry, for, for each other. We're just doing it for ourselves. So, you know, th these are very complicated issues. Uh, and I think you can only judge a specific scenario project or planning opportunity based on an understanding of uh, who is the topic for which the scenarios are being created and what is the nature of the universe that they live in. Can I come in with a more a sort of more general non-scenario point to some extent, which is I quite like timescales of five to 15 years because under five, you just end up with now. Um, and over 15, it, it, it seems to sort of become silly rather, rather rapidly. Um, the other thing I, I, I've just reminded myself of is I had a lovely conversation with a science fiction writer called Lavi Tidar. We were attending some Ministry of Defence workshops looking at 2049 from memory. And um, we had this discussion about well, what, it, what is the future? How do you define future for the practical purpose of writing? And this was about five years ago. And he said, well, it, oh, it's easy. It's, it's when things to start to get rather weird. And this, that now becomes rather complex because I don't know how it could get much weirder than it is right now. I mean, it feels like I'm living in a science fiction film at the moment. Um, so I don't know where you go with that. But yeah, I, I quite like this sort of five to 15. Um, but nevertheless, it gets really interesting when, A, when you go further than that. And also with the matrix generally, I think Oliver would agree with this. It, it gets most challenging intellectually when you absolutely push to the very, very edges of, of each quadrant. Well, you want, you want, you want to be uncomfortable in the process. Yes. That, if that's how you get to be creative. If it all looks sort of uh, pretty much as if it's um, uh, predetermined, then you, you, you're not really going to get into uh, a good place as far as scenario work is concerned. I also raise that a part of a, a question's come in as part of your methodology um, from the audience is about, um, do you generate more than one scenario model and then test them? Maybe you can expand upon your testing of this of each of the scenarios how you go about doing that uh probably i should answer that maybe uh okay. um in, in the in the process a, a typical scenario process so we did a, a terrific process on the future of teaching in in australia that was a two-year process and we went we had about 10 workshops with 60 um teachers uh, from australian schools mainly schools, uh, and we kept creating uh, indicative scenarios and then workshopping them and then discarding some and moving on. Um, I should say at this point that my favorite way of operating is, is, is to develop a matrix 
as a start, but then actually to work on getting rid of the matrix. So what you do is you, you use the matrix to create um, a, a reasonable set of scenarios. You then enrich those worlds uh, and then you allow those worlds to, to go where they want to go. So they get free of the matrix, which toss, you essentially toss the matrix out and you end up with a really rich uh, group of scenarios. Um, and we did a, a good project on the future of business in Australia, which did just that. It had a matrix kind of start, but the finishing position was in a completely different place. So I, think, I yeah. think there's a lot of toing and froing. There's a lot of sticking up, playing with different drivers and thinking, well, that, that, that doesn't work. Or, I mean, Oliver, I remember I sent you some um, energy scenarios from somebody recently and your comment, your initial comment, your instant reaction was, well, that's not orthogonal, you know, one, one driver is a subset of the other, so that, that doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot of playing around. I mean, it's, it's messy. The process is messy. Okay, if I can take a step out from the methodology then, and we've, we've had a further question, we, and we've also been discussing the future of, of Europe and also United States-US relationship. Um, what do you think is going to happen in relation to the developing world? We've seen a, a huge surge in COVID numbers in the developing world, and it seems to be getting larger and larger. What's your thoughts in terms of, of post-COVID planning for the developing world? Will we be having some countries potentially with a vaccine and others, the developing world, struggling once again, facing a, a further virus or, or, or health crisis compared to the, the modern world? What's your thoughts in terms of the developing world? I mean, that, that would suit this matrix quite well, I think, because if you, if you took a sort of another focusing question and applied it to the matrix, if Oliver may violently disagree with this, um, the chaos control profit principle axes um, work beautifully for that because, you know, for example, is the, is the vaccine developed with profit in mind or is it sort of more sort of principled? Um, is, 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 the, is the vaccine sort of the release of it controlled or is it complete chaos? Um, you know, the, all of these things would, would come into play rather well actually I think. Oliver? Yeah I agree. Uh, here comes the sun scenario uh, would be great for uh, the, uh, the, the worlds that we're talking about. Um, the problem with it is that it does require a certain level of paternalism from the rest of the world and I'm not quite sure you know these are these scenarios are just indicative scenarios I'm not sure in that scenario how that particularly why that would happen. Um, the, the other thing, Oliver, we haven't talked about at all here are preferred scenarios. I mean, I've been asked quite a lot recently about, well, what do you think is going to happen? And I think it's almost the wrong question. It, the question should be, well, what, what do you want to happen? So yeah. with regards to the pandemic, how would we like this to play out, which is, is very much playing towards the preferred futures idea? Yeah, so what we do, going back to the scenario process, the five-step process, uh, we, we create a preferred future and then we, we don't use, that's not a scenario. That's literally what it says it is. It's, a, it's, it's an idealization of the world we would like to be in. And then we look at the relationship, when we get towards the strategic part of the process, we look at the relationship between our preferred future and the futures that we look as if, you know, uh, in the words of Paul Keating, we're going to get. Uh, and then we think as strategists, what can we do? As these worlds are emerging, what can we do to try and move things uh, in the direction of where we would like to be? All right. Um, look, I'm conscious of the time. It's now just about to tick over at six o'clock. I, I would like to have this continue this discussion for hours on end. I appreciate it's not probably one o'clock for Richard at the moment, but um, it, it certainly would be a great conversation to continue over a nice glass of red. So look, I just wanted to first personally say thank you to Oliver and Richard for coming on and joining us tonight, uh, this afternoon uh, for the seminar. And, um, and for all the attendees and participants uh, at the webinar, I'd ask if you're not a member of, of reInvent Australia, jump onto our website, have a look at the, the types of activities and events that reInvent Australia has been involved with. Uh, we've got some further um, events coming up later on in the year. So please keep, access, uh, keep up, up to date on our website and also we'll email people um, in terms of future events. So on behalf of reInvent Australia, I'd like to once again thank Richard and Oliver for their time this afternoon and fascinating discussion. Take care. I'll speak soon. Thank you.